Welcome to France 24's Tech Show, I'm Julia Seeger. Have you ever wondered why cat tongues feel like sandpaper? Well, scientists at the Georgia Institute of Technology have the answer. It's thanks to a specific design that also makes it the perfect self-cleaning, tangle-teasing brush. We'll tell you more about how this discovery is set to inspire new technologies. And virtual reality has the power of making all of us better people. That's at least what some Stanford researchers believe. They found that viewers of a VR homelessness experience are more likely to say they care and are more willing to sign an affordable housing petition. This next discovery is proof, if needed, that some of the best design solutions are the simplest and come from the natural world around us. Scientists in the U.S. have found that the spikes present on cats' tongues are actually shaped like little scoops and not like cones as previously thought, allowing them to groom more thoroughly, a design feature that could be applied elsewhere. Olivia salazar Winspear has this report. Scientists tend to spend most of their days in the lab working on their experiments. But researcher Alexis Knoll found that sometimes the most sophisticated solutions are to be found where you least expect them. So I was home for the break during my PhD studies and my family cat Murphy decided to sit on my lap on top of a microfiber blanket. For some reason he thought the blanket smelled really tasty so he decided to take a lick and he actually got his tongue stuck on some of those loops of the fabric. It got me thinking, well why on earth did this tongue get stuck in the first place? Uh, I thought cat tongues were like sandpaper. So I came back to the lab. We happened to have a cat tongue in the freezer and I took a closer look under a microscope. The results came as a surprise. As Alexis inspected the papillae or spines on feline tongues, she noticed their very specific shape. A claw-like form with a U-shaped channel to hold the saliva, which means it can then reach the skin through the fur when a cat licks itself clean. Intelligent design that allows our pets to avoid overheating and which could also be deployed elsewhere. So applications from this tongue study could be uh, new types of carpet cleaning technologies or ways to uh, apply medication to your pet's fur or skin or even potentially ways to reduce allergens in cat fur for people who have allergies. Inspired by Murphy the cat, Alexis has made a prototype brush which mimics the barbs on his tongue using a 3D printer. The closest us humans will get to being as clean as a kitten. And let's now turn to our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar, who is here to tell us more about Google's latest virtual reality project. The tech giant has filed a patent application that details a pair of motorized VR roller skates. That's right, Julia. These VR shoes will be able to track and respond to your feet movements. Now, the goal of these shoes is to keep you confined within the virtual walls of a VR experience. You know, it's very difficult to incorporate movements in VR experiences, and perhaps this could be a great solution uh, to this problem. Uh, uh, according to this uh, patent uh, information, uh, these uh, shoes could be both unidirectional or omnidirectional, so it could let you do a moonwalk uh, 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Dan. Let's keep on talking about VR. According to Stanford's researchers, this new immersive technology can help make people more compassionate. They found that people who saw in virtual reality what it would be like to lose their jobs and homes developed longer lasting compassion towards the homeless than people who read or watched a documentary about their difficult situation. Well, to talk more about this, let's cross over to the co-author of the paper, Jeremy Balinson. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Your study proves that VR can make anyone a better person, and it's often said that immersive technologies are the ultimate empathy machine. What does that mean? So the term ultimate empathy machine was coined by a guy named Chris Milk, who builds virtual reality films. And what I argue is that what VR gets you is an experience. It's an experience that the brain treats as if it were real. And in terms of can VR cause empathy, the way I suggest people think about it Imagine you could have any experience at all. You could become someone else. You could go back in time. You could hire millions of actors to create a scene that was historically recreated. VR can create that experience. So if you believe there's a physical experience that if you were to create it, 
would cause you to think differently about yourself, differently about others, then VR can match that because we can create magical scenes very easily. But if you don't think a physical experience would change the way you think towards others, if you could create it, then VR is not going to help. And now to prove that VR can make people more compassionate, you showed a VR movie entitled Becoming Homeless to Some Participants. What did you discover? Uh, when we designed Becoming Homeless, what we wanted it to do was to try to reverse this narrative that all people are homeless because of who they are. Uh, and it's an experience where you're in your apartment and you're looking around and your landlord knocks on the door and says that you have to pay your rent and you uh, lose your job and you try to sell items, your apartment, you can't do it fast enough, you get evicted. Uh, eventually you end up living inside of your car uh, and then the police uh, take away your car and then you're forced to try to sleep on this bus. It's a very intense experience. And uh, the paper we published uh, last week is based on three or four years work. So one of my graduate students, her name is Fernanda Herrera, and she ran a study where uh, thousands of people went through this experience. And we looked at how becoming homeless in virtual reality caused behavior change compared to traditional uh, metrics such as role playing or reading about statistics or simply playing a 2D video game. And what she discovered uh, was even when you look two months after the experience, so you do becoming homeless in VR, and then we check two months later, the virtual reality experience causes you to sign a petition that says, I am willing to have my personal taxes increased uh, in order to support affordable housing measures. In other words, this experience of actually becoming homeless in virtual reality causes you to change your behavior even two months later. If immersive experiences can impact our actions, should we fear future psychological manipulation through VR? And if so, should we build an ethic for VR to avoid a so-called black mirror effect? When we think of the downsides of VR, we think about addiction. The experiences are so amazing that people don't want to go outside. We think about distraction. You can't see the real world when you're wearing the goggles, so perhaps you bump into walls or you uh, step on the cat. Um, we had our first death in virtual reality. A man in Moscow fell through a plate glass table while wearing the goggles because he couldn't see and then bled to death. My book is called Experience on Demand because virtual reality creates an experience. And the next step in terms of figuring out what it's gonna do to us, both good and bad, is if you had that experience in the real world, what would it do to you? And that's the metric one should consider. Think of VR not as a media experience, but as more like an actual one where the brain treats it as if it were real. Well, thank you so much for that, Jeremy Balingson. I really appreciate you having me and, and thanks for the work you do. Now, Dan, it's very surprising, but virtual reality can strengthen the hallucinatory uh, characteristics of some images. And uh, Google actually proved that with Deep Dream, a Deep Dream algorithm. That's right, Julia. These images were a result of an experiment with Google's uh, deep neural network, which uses deep learning. So essentially, this network is trained to identify features such as animals or objects uh, in images and to strengthen those uh, features in uh, the next feed. So here, as you can see, you see there's a normal video of a marketplace, but now the network has been trained to identify images of dogs. And as it goes into feedback loop, this becomes stronger and stronger, and it modifies the original image, and completely, it completely gets distorted, and what right. you see here is a, is a hallucinatory image. Right, now, these pictures are playing a trick on us. Absolutely. Now, uh, researchers from the University of Sussex, they have used these images into a VR experience in order to understand the underlying mechanisms of uh, our consciousness. They call this particular system a hallucination machine. Let's reassure our viewers these perceptions can play tricks on us, but our minds are still strong enough to control this. That's right, Julia. This is uh, demonstrated in the latest brain-machine uh, interface developed by the US-based startup Neurable. Uh, if you remember, it was not a long time ago when we were able to control the movement of, of a ball by just using our mind power on this uh, set. That's so right. That, yeah, that was done because of uh, the uh, firing of neurons that uh, generate these microelectric signals, which are interpreted by the software, and that results in the corresponding motion. So the, so the principle is somewhat uh, similar here. So there's a game called The Awakening, in which a child is supposed to escape a lab, and you play the role of a child, and you do so by picking uh, certain objects. Now, 
again, as you see an object, a certain uh, certain neurons are fired, and again, impulses are generated, and they are uh, you know translated by the uh, software into the corresponding actions. So, if you want to pluck an object, that particular firing of neurons will result in you plucking that particular object. Thank you, Dan. Let's move on to test 24. And this week we take a look at a smart toothbrush and a corresponding app that is set to give you the most perfect and brightest smile, Dan. That's right. This toothbrush is called the M1 Connect, made by Colgate, but it is a, there's a collaboration with the French uh, company Colibri. Which is, a, which is an expert in making uh, connected toothbrushes. So uh, it's a very practical toothbrush. First of all, it's non-electric. Uh, of course, there's a battery in order to power the Bluetooth connection. So all you have to do is just move this brush and it connects with your app. And as you can see here, as I simulate the, uh, the, uh, the brushing, brushing movement, you can see, you see the images directly on the app. So it, so right. it gives you statistics, it tells you uh, how much time you spend brushing, what is the ideal time, which areas were covered or not covered, and what uh, more you should do in order to ensure that all your teeth get properly brushed. That's one part. Second part is that uh, you can replace the top. So if something, if the top gets broken, you can just replace the top instead of, you know, re buying the entire system. And the third part is that it's very light. And right. It's very easy to use. And they should develop that for kids to make it a much more fun moment. Well, there's a game which uh, keeps uh, kids engaged. So as they, you know, do well in the game, they get uh, more encouragement to brush more, I guess. I'm going to have to get one then. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24. But do stay with us here on France 24.